Jean-Pierre, let me start with uh, you for a simple definition of epigenetics. Well, when people ask me about epigenetics, Bella, I just tell them, look at me or look at the mirror. What do you see? And what, what you see, if you look at me, you see skin, you see eyes, you see hair. If Superman was in the audience, you'd also see liver and lungs and bones and all of that. And uh, we have more than 200 different tissues in our bodies. They're very different. They don't look alike. They're very stable. And here's the mystery. We have 200 tissues, one DNA sequence. So Dr. Watson, when he discovered the structure of DNA, couldn't explain that. How could you get, go from one DNA sequence to 200 different tissues at the same time in the same person? And so in the 1950s, Conrad Waddington, a biologist, was studying this question and postulated there must be something that works on top of the DNA sequence. And this is where the term epigenetics comes from, epigenetics. And at the time, he didn't know what it was, but he said there must be something that modulates the genes in different tissues. We now know what it is. Uh, Francis, a little bit more on the word epigenetics. What does epi mean? Epi and top of, above. Um, genetics, obviously, the, now we refer to that as the DNA. So these are all factors that come around the DNA and ultimately affect how likely it will be that the DNA is red or not. Possibilities of trauma or famine affecting what happens in people's physical lives three, maybe even four or six generations later. Children of PTSD in various horrible things that have happened in the past bearing these marks. Enormous implications for law, for society, is it not? Yeah, enormous implications. And one of the most interesting implications is that about 10 years ago, when the human genome was sequenced, some scientists were saying, well, that's the end. We're going to understand every disease. We're going to understand every behavior. And it turns out we didn't, because the sequence of the DNA isn't enough to explain behavior. It isn't enough to explain diseases. And that's where I think the field of epigenetics took off, because even hardcore geneticists started saying, wait a minute, why are these people with the same DNA behaving differently or having different diseases? And they started paying attention to us. On that point, people with the same <laughs> DNA, we all have heard of identical twins, the same DNA at the beginning, and as they grew to be older and older women, differences appeared. What is this teaching us, Francis? Well, when the first discovery came to light that you know, we have these identical genomes, but they start diverging in terms of their character, in terms of what they're doing in, in the individual. Um, there was evidence that there was an epigenetic divergence. So when you're young uh, and you're twins, you have very similar epigenomes. When you're older and you're twins, you have very divergent epigenetic epigen features. And so the implications was that as you walk through life, as you have your unique experiences uh, through that lifespan, your epigenetic changes are mirroring those, those experiences. So be, to be specific here, what you all have learned is that genes can turn on and off and that they need instructions. They don't just sit there and do what they do. They need different instructions and may get different instructions to do different things at different times in a person's life. Exactly. Having DNA is great. We need it. Um, but we need to also know what and wh when genes need to be turned on and, and turned off. So the, the light switch, the timing is in incredibly important to development and, and functioning.